Okay, if you want to grab your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts 26 this morning. Uh, Acts chapter 26, as we uh, are uh, going through this, uh, this book, and we're nearing the end of it. Uh, there's only a couple chapters left after this. Uh, if you can believe it, uh, uh, this is the middle of April, and after today, we will actually only have three more classes uh, on the book of Acts, so we've got to finish, uh, got to finish the book. We'll finish chapter 26 today and then have uh, two chapters left uh, to wrap up the book. When you get to Acts chapter 26, if you just start reading in verse 1, you're kind of in the middle uh, of, uh, of what's transpiring with King Agrippa. And so back up for just a second into uh, Acts chapter 25 and uh, just get the context of what is happening. And then, uh, uh, and then we'll get into chapter 26. In Acts chapter 25... If you look in verse 13, uh, that's where you are introduced to King Agrippa. This is uh, King Agrippa II, uh, obviously from a, uh, a very uh, uh, violent family of the, of the Herods. Uh, King Agrippa had come to Caesarea. Uh, he had come there to welcome uh, Festus to his new position as the governor of Judea. And while Agrippa is there with Festus, um, apparently... Paul and his, uh, and his case seemed to just be dinner conversation back then. Um, it seemed to be something that was brought up to everybody who would, who would have an ear to it. And uh, on this occasion, King Agrippa is there and uh, Festus decides, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this information with King Agrippa. And so uh, he begins explaining to Agrippa there in verse 14 and 15 of chapter 25. He explains... Uh, Paul's situation explains what he had done uh, concerning that situation uh, and that Paul had appealed unto Caesar, which is what Paul did in verse 11. Uh, Paul had appealed to go and stand before Caesar. In chapter 25 and verse 22, Agrippa said to Festus, you know, I'd like to hear this man. I, I, I have been wanting to hear uh, this man, Paul, and so Festus says to Agrippa in chapter 25, verse 22, okay, tomorrow you shall hear him. So when you start reading verse 23, Acts 25, verse 23, you start reading there, and there is a large gathering in an auditorium uh, for this occasion where Paul is going to be brought in uh, and put on trial before Agrippa. Uh, you have in chapter 25 and verse 23 that Agrippa and Bernice, who is his sister, uh, and also his lover. Uh, they come in, in verse 23, the Bible says, with great pomp. Uh, there is a great ceremony. There is uh, the Greek word for pomp. There is the word fantasia. Uh, this, this is a great uh, ceremonial occasion. They entered, and then uh, verse 23 says that the commanders, these are commanders of a thousand men each, come in. Then the leading dignitaries, the prominent men of the city, uh, come in. There's Festus, the governor. So you get all of this, you get this festive occasion, you have all of this glitz and glamour with the king and the governor and the dignitaries who are there, and then the end of verse 23 says that Festus had Paul brought in. Uh, Paul is not decked out in the glitz and the glamour. He doesn't have all of the, uh, the festivities about his entrance into the room. Here comes a prisoner in the midst of all of this. And there he is standing in chains. And so in verse 24 of chapter 25, Festus explains the reason for the gathering. And basically his explanation is, Paul has appealed to Caesar. I've got to send him to Caesar. But I've got to have a good reason to tell Caesar that I'm sending Paul to him. Because this just, this doesn't sound good. This innocent man, I am sending an innocent man to Caesar. And so Festus says to Agrippa, can you help me out a little bit? I need some help in knowing what to say. And that's what he says down in verse 26 and 27. Uh, he says in verse, uh, uh, the end of verse 26, I need something that I can write to, to, uh, to Caesar to tell him why I'm sending him. And then he says in verse 27, it seems unreasonable to send a prisoner and not specify the charges against him. Of course, there are no charges that have any validity, and so he's uh, really grasping here uh, in that regard. So now we're going to look at chapter 26, but that kind of sets the scene for us so that we know what's happening 
when we get to Acts chapter 26. In verse 1, Agrippa motions over to Paul and says, okay, Paul, you've got the floor. And so Paul is permitted to speak. Uh, He's standing before a king, and you have on your handout uh, that uh, almost 25 years before this, Jesus, when Paul was on the road to Damascus, Jesus told him that he would stand before kings in Acts 9 and verse 15. I don't know if Paul actually believed that when he was on the road to Damascus, but here he is almost 25 years later, and that's what he's doing. He's had opportunity to stand before um, these Roman commanders. He's had opportunity to stand before various dignitaries and the governors. And now he's standing before a king. And look at how he responds in chapter 26, verse 2. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews. Would you have been happy? If you had been in prison, back in chapter 24 and verse 27, Paul had been in in the Caesarea prison for two years. Based upon what conviction? There was no conviction. Based upon what sentence? There was never any sentence handed down. He's just being held in a prison uh, without any charges, having any weight to bring about any sentence. So here he is standing before a king. Would you have been happy in this situation? Here's Paul getting ready to give, uh, the New King James has the word answer. I don't know if you've got the word answer in verse 1 and in verse 2. You may have the word defense uh, because that's another word that's used here. Uh, The Greek word is the word that we get the word apologetics from. This idea of an an answer or defense, that's what he's about ready to give. Is his uh, his apologetic, his his reason for uh, for what was happening. Now, one reason he was happy to be for Agrippa is because of what he says in verse 3. He says to Agrippa, I'm happy to be standing before you because you are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. What would make King Agrippa an expert regarding the Jews? Here's a man who had been uh, given, he had been given charge. He had been given rule over the Jews. He was, he was the king. Now, we, we've, looked at various, um, we've looked at various men who had authority over the temple. Uh, we talked about uh, Claudius Lysias, who was the Roman commander on site, uh, who had command over the temple. But here's the king. Here's King Agrippa. He has authority over the Jews. He has authority over the temple. He is the one, he's the one who chooses the Jews' high priest. Now, that's a little backwards from Old Testament history, isn't it? Uh, Old Testament history, is it, the, is it a king who is supposed to choose the high priest? Here, here's a man, he can choose a high priest from, well, whoever he wants to be high priest. He can make that person a high priest. Here's a man who has knowledge of the Jewish system. Uh, he has been an authority over it uh, for uh, several years to this point. And Paul knows him to be an expert in Jewish customs and Jewish law. Uh, And so Paul sees that as a great opportunity uh, to present his case before him. And so he starts, uh, as is his his usual custom, Paul starts presenting his case. And uh, what he does is he uh, begins very early on in his life. Uh, Roman numeral number one, uh, letter B under your handout there. He began to rehearse his early life. Uh, that from a youth, he says in verse 4, that he, uh, he spent his time in Jerusalem. And he says in verse 4, all the Jews know this. These Jews, they know me. They know where I'm from. The, the very people who have put Paul on trial, Paul says, they, they know where I've come from. And where has he come from? Look at verse 5. They know me. They know me from the first. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect, what was the strictest sect of the Jews? Pharisees. According to the strictest sect of our religion, I have lived a Pharisee. Paul says, this, this charge against me, that somehow I am an enemy 
of the Jews. Paul says, excuse me, how can I be considered? How can I be considered the arch enemy of the Jews when historically I have been trained, I have been educated, I have been brought up in the strictest sect of our religion. Notice the, uh, the plural pronoun, our religion. That's the way I've lived as a Pharisee. And now I'm standing before you and here's the reason I'm being judged. He, he, knows, that he knows what's happening. The reason I'm being judged in verse 6, he says, is for the hope of the promise made, by, made to our fathers. What does that mean? Paul says, I am standing here today. I'm standing here on trial. And the reason I am standing here on trial is because of the hope of the promise that God made to our fathers. What, what, what was that hope? The Messiah? That the, that the Messiah was going to come, that he would die, that he would be buried. And then what would happen to him? Then he would be raised from the dead. And the very fact that Jesus was raised from the dead is testimony to the fact that all men will be raised from the dead. You have in verse 6 the word hope. And you, you have that word about three times here in verses 6, 7, and 8. And uh, uh, Paul, Paul had said, and, and I was going to reference back a couple other verses earlier, but uh, Paul had said several times that he was on trial because of his teaching on the resurrection. Now look, what are the last four words, at least that's the way it is in my Bible, last four words you have in verse 8, chapter 26, verse 8. God raises the dead. You might draw a line between the word hope in verse 6 and those last four words in verse 8. That's the hope. Paul says, I am on trial for the hope of the promise that God made to our fathers. What's that hope? That hope is that once you die, that's not it. Uh, on, on the back of your handout, go, look on the back of your handout, uh, Roman numeral number 2, letter A. And on the back of your handout, here's the hope that God has given to mankind, and that is that God raises the dead. It's appointed unto man once to die. So after you die, is that it? No. There, there's going, after that's the judgment, Hebrews 9 verse 27 says, before we're judged, we're going to be raised from the dead. And what does Paul say in Acts chapter 26? That's why I'm on trial. Now, this whole idea of being raised from the dead, was that just a New Testament concept? Was that something new that came about with Christianity? No. Paul says this was a promise that God made to our fathers, to the Jewish fathers. There, there was a hope of a resurrection, not just among, uh, among New Testament Christians, but this hope of the resurrection was something uh, that had been promised from, from the early days of mankind. When Abraham took Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice. And by faith, he, he took him all the way to that mountain, laid him on the altar, and he raised that knife to kill his son Isaac. He was willing to kill his son Isaac, although he knew in his head that what, had, what promise had God made. Through your seed, all the nations of the earth be blessed. You shall have a great nation. What's he looking at laying on top of that altar? His seed. His son, the one through whom the great nation is going to come. If I kill the son, hello, you know, I've, it took me 25 years to get this seed. How many more years do I have? Can I get another seed? But he was willing to do that. Why does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about Abraham's faith? What did he believe? That if he killed his son, what did Abraham believe? God was able to raise him up. Well, where did Abraham ever get that idea? Had he read the New Testament to get a concept of the resurrection of the dead? No, this is a promise that God had made early on. And so that's what Paul is saying here, is that he's not on trial based upon some new Christian doctrine. He is on trial. Now look in verse 6, chapter 26 and verse 6. I'm on trial for the hope of the promise that was made to our fathers. Now look at what he says in verse 7. To this promise, 
Our 12 tribes, notice that plural pronoun again. Our 12 tribes, the Israelite nation, they earnestly were serving God night and day, hoping to attain this promise. Why were the Israelites serving God? Because they knew there was a resurrection of the dead. They knew that there was more to life than just this this existence on this earth. So there's that word hope again. He says the hope was the promise made to our fathers. The hope is what our fathers earnestly strove for in order to attain. The middle of verse 7 says, And it is for this hope's sake, King Agrippa, that I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought unbelievable by you that God raises the dead? Had God already proven that he could raise the dead? Yes. Yes. He had already proven that. He had proven that in the resurrection of Jesus. Go over to verse 23, same chapter. Chapter 26, verse 23. As as Paul is winding down, or actually before he's interrupted by Festus, but this is the end of his defense. He says in verse 23 that the Christ would suffer and that he would be the first to rise from the dead. Well, Christ did rise from the dead. What's the significance of saying that he would be the first to rise from the dead? If somebody's first, that means there's going to be somebody afterwards. If you run a race and you come in first. Now, if you were the only one running the race, okay? Those of you who got out this morning and ran a race, I pity you, okay? No, those of you who got out this morning and ran a race with yourself, did you come in first? I guess, Guess what? You came in last, too, because you were the only one in the race. This idea of the resurrection, was Jesus the only one that would be raised from the dead? If so, why would it put the word first? But if he puts the word first, what does that indicate? Oh, there's going to be some other ones that come afterwards. That's the hope that not only the Jews had, but that's the hope that we had, that just as God raised Jesus from the dead, He's going to raise us from the dead also. Come back to chapter 26, verse 9. Paul transitions. Transitions from uh, the fact that he had been testifying to the Jews and transitions into what he was doing um, during his life as a Jew. And here he states very strongly in chapter 26, verse 9. He said, Indeed, I myself thought... I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I want you to let that sink in for a second. Paul said, I believed that I needed to oppose Christ. That's what he says, but he says it more emphatically than that. Paul says, I myself thought that I needed to do things against this Jesus of Nazareth. He says that, but he says it even more emphatic than that. I myself thought that I must, not that I should, not that I felt compelled, I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Paul, what, what what was your life like? What was your motivation? What was your intent before you became a Christian? My intent was to wipe out Christianity. To kill every Christian that I could come across. Now go back to chapter 23, verse 1. We noted this when we came through chapter 23. Notice notice how he words this in chapter 23, verse 1. Paul looked at the council when he's standing before the Sanhedrin on that occasion. And he says, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Paul, you mean that when you were persecuting Christians, you had a good conscience about it? How could you have a good conscience about that? Come back to chapter 26. Look look at what he says. uh, and We're going to come back to verse 9 in just a second. But Paul, how can you, look in verse 10. How can you have a good conscience? When he says, many of the saints, by the way, those aren't dead people, right? Because he shut them up in prison. It'd be pretty easy to shut up dead people in prison, right? He's not talking about dead people. Saints are living disciples. He says, many of the saints, I shut them up in prison. Paul, where'd you get the authority to do that? Oh, from the chief priests. Same chief priests that were now putting him on trial were the ones who gave him authority to persecute the Christians. 
He not only shut them up in prisons, and in verse 10 says, when he had opportunity, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. When I had opportunity, every time I had opportunity, I was voting that they would be put to death. Paul, you had a good conscience to do that. Look at verse 11. I punished them often in every synagogue. That indicates that he went into the synagogues and there inside the synagogues, he punished them for what they were doing and following after Christ. He not only punished them inside the synagogues, but he tried to force them. The New American Standard says he tried to force them to blaspheme. How would you try to force a Christian to blaspheme, to speak against the Lord? Would you threaten them? Would you threaten their family? Would you do something horrible to try to force them to blaspheme? I want you to pick, and, and what does Paul say? I was fine with this. I was, I, was, I was in all good conscience while I was punishing them and trying to force them to blaspheme. And the end of verse 11, he says, and being exceedingly enraged against them. This guy is, this guy's mad. He's exceedingly enraged against the Christians. He says, I persecuted them. And it's not that I was just satisfied in these Jewish cities. I persecuted them even to the outskirts, even into the foreign cities. As far as I could persecute them, I did it. And all the while, Paul says, I did this with a good conscience. Dirk? Sure. Yeah, it's same, same thing that, that those Jews who kept following after Paul uh, and persecuting him, Dirk says, they, they, they were not satisfied just to stay in one city. They were, they were pursuing him even to other, uh, other places trying to, uh, trying to bring harm to him. How could Paul have a good conscience in doing all of this? Well, come back to verse 9. In verse 9 he says, I myself thought... He had formed the opinion, right or wrong, this, was his, this is what he had formed. He had formed the opinion that I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus. And look, look at how verse 10 set, starts, this I also did. Paul says, here's what I thought. And so based upon what I thought, that's what I did. If I think something is right, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to do what I think is right. And while I'm doing it, am I going to think it's wrong? Of course not. I've convinced myself that it's a right thing to do. Ruth? Sure. Uh, if I understand what Ruth is saying, Paul, if Paul says he persecuted the Christians uh, in all good conscience, is it possible that some of these Jews who were uh, trying to persecute and cause uh, all of this harm against Paul, were they doing it in all good conscience? Well, I, 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 want, I want you to think about to, to people in today's world. Why are there people who are doing drugs? Why are there people who are involved in, uh, in, uh, uh, in various salacious activities? Why are there people who are involved in sin? Why are there people uh, who would go out and rape somebody? Why are there people who would go out and murder somebody? Is it because they think it's wrong? Or is it because they think it's okay? Is it that their conscience has pricked them? You do what you think is the right thing to do. What does Proverbs 14 and verse 12 say? There's a way that seems right. Boy, this looks like I think this is the right thing to do. There's a way that seems right unto a man, comma. You know what the very next word is? But. <laughs> That's not a good sign, right? Oh, this seems right to me. No, it's not. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the way, the end thereof is the way of death. So just because I think something is right, this same, this same terminology where Paul says, I myself thought that this was okay. It's the same terminology that you read about with, uh, with Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, behold, I, I, I thought that, he would, that Elijah would come out and tell me to do something great and wonderful, and, uh, or Elisha would come out and tell me to do something great and wonderful, and this is not what I thought was going to happen. What's happening? 
We, we, they're, they're allowing their thoughts to direct their activities. And if you allow your thoughts, your opinions, your personal beliefs to direct your activities, Proverbs 14 and verse 12 says, where's that going to lead? It's going to lead to, to death, to separation. Richard? I'm not sure I like parallels in this church. Okay. You're right. He, 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 believed, uh, he believed that what he was doing was absolutely what he was called to do. And that not only what it was... Now, he says here, as well as back in chapter 9, that he was doing these things by the authority of the chief priests. That he had received authority and, and commission later on in this chapter. Uh, he uses the word not just authority... Uh, but the word commission down in verse 12. He journeyed to Damascus with authority and with commission. He had been commissioned by the chief priest. Now, here are religious individuals. Here's Paul. Here's the chief priest. Religious, indivi- very religious uh, individuals in the Jewish religion. Um, what did they think that this that uh, that they were doing the work of God? Did they believe? That what they were doing, they had been called by God to do it. Yes, absolutely. It's what they believed. And they believed it with all their heart, with all good conscience. They were going about doing those things. Now, take that and apply it to us. Maybe, maybe, not, maybe not in the, uh, in the sinful, salacious illustrations we used. Take it and apply it to us in a religious sense today. Could I in a religious sense think that I am doing something for God, claiming I'm doing it for God, thinking it's what He wants me to do, and all the while be doing something that He absolutely does not want me to be doing. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, and down to verse 23, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, why not? Here's somebody with all good conscience saying, Lord, Lord. And Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does will of my Father in heaven. It says in verse 22, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in thy name? Haven't we cast out demons in thy name? Haven't we done many wonders in thy name? Lord, we've done all of this for you. Isn't that what Paul was doing? Was he doing these things for his God? And what did Jesus say in verse 23? I'll say to those, depart from me. I never knew you. How can that be? Because there is is, uh, uh, nothing right about doing something that might please our conscience if our conscience is not properly trained. Somebody says, well, my conscience didn't bother me. My conscience didn't, you know, I, I did that in all good conscience. Well, how was your conscience trained? What was it the word of God, the entirety and the fullness of God's revelation that trained your conscience? Or was it society? Was it our media? Was it our entertainment industry? What was it that trained somebody's conscience to believe something was right or wrong? Dirk? What I was going to say is he goes on to say the workers of iniquity, which is Right. Right. And, and so there, there, was, there, was a, there was a violation of the law uh, in Matthew 7, verse 23. They were workers of iniquity because they were, they were stepping outside the bounds uh, of what God actually desired. Be, because of time, let's just abbreviate 
uh, some of this. Go to, go to cha- chapter 26 and verse 12. Uh, we have seen this. And here's what's interesting. This is the third time that we're reading about Paul's conversion. Why do we read about Paul's conversion three times? You got it? He's converted in chapter 9. Then he rehearses it again in chapter 22. And then again in chapter 26. Uh, didn't, didn't we get it the first time? Why, why do we need it two more times? Here is, a, here is an, an event that God wanted us to understand the significance of this event in church history. Here is the worst persecutor of Christianity becoming its best proponent. How did that happen? Well, it happened because, look at verse 15, Jesus says, I am Jesus. He says in verse 17, rise and stand, for I have appeared to you. Did, uh, did Paul believe that Jesus of Nazareth, to use the terminology from verse 9, I must do many things contrary to Jesus of Nazareth. Did Paul believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God? Absolutely not. And on the road to Damascus, what happened? At noon, a light brighter than the sun appeared Shine down on him. He fell down on the ground and a voice says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting and I have appeared to you. It's not just a voice that he hears. Paul saw Jesus of Nazareth on the road to Damascus. And everything about him changed. This is a significant event in church history. It's a significant event to teach us about the validity of the resurrection of Christ. Jesus calls upon him to become, in verse 16, a minister and a witness of the things that he had seen and the things that he would see. He tells him in verse 17 that he would deliver him uh, from the Jews and from the Gentiles. And here's what his commission was. He had a commission earlier Back up in verse 12, he had a commission from the chief priests to go and persecute Christians. But here's the commission that Paul has from Jesus in verse 18. I'm sending you to the Jews and the Gentiles to open their eyes. Look on the back of your handout. Is this in Roman numeral number two? Letters B and C just to have a couple applications of this. Jesus says, I'm sending you to open their eyes. Well, what does that indicate about their eyes before they were opened? That's not hard, right? The opposite of open. Here are some people's eyes who were closed to the gospel. What was Paul's responsibility? Go and open them. How do you open somebody's eyes? Teach them. How were Paul's eyes opened? Were his eyes closed to the truth before this? Yeah. How were his eyes opened? Jesus was proven to be the Son of God. How was Paul going to open the eyes of these rebellious Jews? Is there any other gospel than that Jesus is the Son of God? That's it. And so when Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I I determined to know, know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. If that doesn't open somebody's eyes... Nothing else will. Or at least nothing else should. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness, the way of Satan, to light. To turn them from the power of Satan to God in order that they might receive. Here's the ultimate goal. His purpose was to go and help them be saved. And the back of your handout says, in order that they might receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified. God wants all people to be saved. And in order for all people to be saved, they have to follow His plan of salvation. Look at verse 19. He says to Agrippa, I was not disobedient to what Jesus told me to do. I received this heavenly vision, and I was not disobedient to it, but I went and I declared the gospel Look down at verse 20, the end of verse 20, where he says, I declared that they should repent. 
turn to God and do works that were befitting repentance. There was a repentance that involves a turn of the mind. And then there was the actual turn to God. We don't have time to develop this, but this is on your handout. I believe it's on the back um, where it, it talks about this turning to God being baptism. And that's involved in uh, earlier passages and those are listed on your handout. But he says in verse 21, but this is why the Jews seized me. They seized me because I'm going around preaching the gospel and they tried to kill me. But the Lord helped me. In verse 22, I have been witnessing the small and great, middle of verse 22 says, and I'm not saying anything else except what the prophets and Moses said would come. He says that for the Jews' benefit. What are the Jews saying? He's the ultimate enemy of Judaism. He, he, he's, uh, he, he's out there. He has become a Christian. And now he's teaching everything opposing Judaism. And what did Paul just say? I'm not opposing Judaism. I'm not teaching anything against the Old Testament. In fact, everything he says that I teach is founded upon the Old Testament. So Festus interrupts him in verse 24. And he says, Paul, you're a crazy man. You've lost your mind. The Greek word here is mania, from which we get the word maniac. Paul, you're a maniac. You're nuts. Much learning has driven, is driving you mad. And notice how calmly he responds. Not mad, most noble Festus. But I speak the words of truth and reason. Apparently, Festus was not interested in truth and reason. And so he opposes what is being taught. And then notice in verse 26 that he says to Festus, And the king before whom I speak, he knows these things. He says, because these things were not done in a corner. Uh, Agrippa knows about these things because Christianity is something that has been proven in revealed fact uh, throughout, uh, throughout the time of Jesus and even in the years that followed this is something that has been obvious to all observers. But Agrippa not only knows them in verse 26, what does Paul say in verse 27? Agrippa believes them. Agrippa knows these things to be true. And Agrippa believes the prophets and what they had prophesied about Jesus. That mean that Agrippa was saved. He knew the truth. He even believed what the prophets said. Was he saved? No, he even says he wasn't saved in verse 28. He says, depending on your translation, the King James, New King James says, you almost persuade me. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the better translations on that indicate that with just a few words, with just a small amount of words, you might have persuaded me. You might have persuaded me. To what? To become a Christian. He knew the truth, believed the truth, but he, that did not make him a Christian. Paul says in verse 29, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become also, uh, both almost and altogether such as I am, a Christian, except for these chains. Here's the King Agrippa. He could have been, perhaps, persuaded to become a Christian, but he was not willing to make the next step. He was not willing to take that next step into it. And so you get to the end of verse 20, chapter 26. Agrippa and the council come together. But what they determine is this guy has appealed to Caesar. He's innocent. He has done absolutely nothing worthy of death. But Roman protocol requires he's appealed to Caesar. He's got to go to Caesar. Now think about for just a second Paul's situation. Paul has gone from preaching the gospel all around the world and now being bound, arrested as a prisoner, being carried to Rome, the gospel is being spread even to the highest people on the earth. When we get to Colossians 1 and verse 23, the Bible says that the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven, including these Roman dignitaries. A lot more we could do there. I know we had some more comments, couldn't get to them, but 
Thank you for your good attention this morning.